Welcome to ID the Future, a podcast of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. I'm Paul Nelson, a fellow of the Center, and today I'm joined from Cologne, Germany, by biologist Wolf Eckhart Lernig. Dr. Lernig is a retired geneticist at the Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research in Cologne. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Lernig. Thank you for inviting me and uh, having me. Recently, there was a debate held in Canada between Steve Meyer of the Discovery Institute and Lawrence Krauss, a physicist, and the issue of the randomness of natural selection came up. This is a very important topic, both for the understanding of natural selection, but also for considering possible alternatives to that process and to its role within neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory. So let me ask you, first of all, does the process of natural selection include what we might call an inescapable element of randomness? Well, that's a very interesting, very good question. You know that usually there's an enormous amount of polemics against any connection between natural selection and randomness. And especially by Richard Dawkins and many others and Lawrence Carls, which you have just mentioned. And well, uh, Dawkins is, according to a poll of 2013, the world's top thinker. And he is especially fond of denying the connection between randomness and natural selection. But the point is that we have an appallingly great reproductive powers of living being, as Dr. Chansky said it in 1937. And he mentioned some examples like the fungus Vicoperidon bovista producing 700 billion spores and Cisumbrium zofia and Nicotiana tabacum respectively 730,000 and 360,000 seed. Salmon, 28 million eggs per season. The American oyster, 150 million eggs in a single spawning. And so he was really correct, saying, quote, death and destruction of a majority of all of the individuals produced undoubtedly takes place. So, well, the question was, of course, well, do it from these enormous numbers of progeny are uh, only the very best surviving these uh, reproduce. Because if a population is to remain numerically stationary, only a very few can reproduce. And that's why some French biologists have raised the question, as I quoted in the post on evolution news and views by Quinault, that the example of the green frog out of 120,000 fertilized eggs of the green frog, quote, only two individuals survive. Are we to conclude that these two frogs out of 120,000 were selected by nature because they were the fittest ones? Or rather, as Quinault said, the natural selection is nothing but blind mortality, which lacks nothing at all. This is the other extreme in the uh, opinion on natural selection. But now, transfer these questions to the 700 billion spores of Lycoperidon, or the 140 million eggs multiplied with the number of spawning seasons of the American oyster, and so on, and then it is inescapable that a large number of these are due to a random process of elimination. And so there is, without a doubt, a strong element of randomness in natural selection. And especially so when you think of the New Darwinian interpretation of selection. Yes, and it seems that the challenge to the Neo Darwinian view of evolution is that in order to find novel structures and functions, the process must search in a very large space. But because it's doing so without direction, 
it is unlikely to hit the functional targets. Can you say something about that? That the search well, spaces well, involved are enormous. First, I would like to point out that usually they count with new alleles with even less than 1% selective advantage. And there has been a long tradition in population genetics to stipulate uh, the numbers, how many can survive. And, well, there was Fischer in Topchansky, Schmidt, Rabin, and others, Futuima, Maynard Smith, they all came to the conclusion that, to quote directly Griffiths, the chance of a mutation that is 1% better in fitness than the standard of real in the population will be lost 98% of the time by genetic drift. So if 98% of the time are lost by genetic drift with a 1% advantage, well, Fisher stipulated that more than 90% in the next 33 generations will be lost. So there must be, of necessity, a strong element of randomness in natural selection, especially, as you just pointed out, in this vast space of, as That's Richard Dawkins formulated, quote, if you think of all possible ways of arranging bits of an animal, almost all of them would turn out to be dead. Yes. More ac accurately, they'd mostly never be born. Each species of animal plant is an island of workability set in a vast sea of inconceivable arrangements, most of which would, if they ever came to existence, die. And then also one must consider that the enormous numbers just quoted for some organisms, well, it is the juvenile stages which were the losses most important. And so most of these will never come to an adult uh, stage in which we produce. So an enormous amount of individuals is simply lost due to random situations. And that's why I stress that point that there's the hiding places in, say, speaking of mammals, for example, of predator and prey, distance between them, local differences of biotopes, geographical circumstances, weather conditions, microclimates, all belong to the repertoire of infinitely varying parameters. So co necessarily, coincidence, accidents, and chance occurrences are strongly significant in the lives of all individual species, especially so in the juvenile stages. And then there's also the effect of modifications which are by definition non-heritable. And, well, a textbook example, a typical is, take a young dandelion, cut it in half, plant it in the uh, lowland, and in the other half in the high mountains, and you will have strongly different plants. One, well, they are different in size, three times the lowland form is larger, the leaves, the flowers are larger, and if you compare them with the highland form, you will find enormous differences. And these are all non-heritable. So these modifications may be much more powerful than the effects of mutations which have only slight or even invisible effects of the phenotype, which is always stressed and emphasized by Maya and many others, by Dawkins also. So there must of necessity be an enormous amount of randomness in natural selection. Do you think that introducing randomness into biological explanation when we are dealing with complex structures and the origin of novelty, do you think that randomness creates a problem for biologists when they try to explain how things came to be? Well, the point is that randomness is often viewed very negatively. Yes. I have here some uh, Tezauros definitions, proceeding made or occurring without definite aim, without definite reason, then it is, of course, uh, in slang, it is also uh, unknown, identified, while well, these negative overtones to self
tell such a theory to the public and stressing randomness as Jacques Monod, the French Nobel laureate, seems to be counterproductive. Jacques Monod in Chance and Necessity, near the end of the book, says, our number came up in the Monte Carlo game. In other yeah. words, he, for philosophical reasons, makes it very clear that the only options open to a biologist to explain life are chance and necessity. And for that reason, he says, we must rely on a significant, inescapable element of, in English, we call it luck. But I think many people, both lay people and scientists, regard that as implausible. Can you say why you think that relying on randomness or luck or the Monte Carlo outcome is implausible? Well, if you look at an animal, if you look at human beings, if you look at any organ, normally functioning organ of a human being, it is so well designed that immediately that's a thought which occurs to almost everybody immediately without a reflection. These structures working together, consisting of many different parts, attuned to each other, and then an explanation like randomness, as the origin of all these structures and forms, which called most beautiful, well, they are really most beautiful, but to explain them by an endless series of accidental mutations doesn't seem reasonable at first glance, at least. And so I think that is an important point that why in the... Uh, Selling strategy or the propaganda to sell Darwinism, that's, that's why they shrink back from these points. But these are, are things, things are really so obvious that there is an enormous amount of randomness evolved about this. It contradicts the immediate impression. If you take any textbook of human anatomy or animal uh, anatomy, or in the post here, we have that beautiful cat, that cheetah. Yes. And, well, just to explain it by this endless series of even of small or even effects on the mutations with small or even effects on the phenotype, this is something which is hard to digest for any uh, unbiased people. You know, I think you're right, and I think that evolutionary biologists themselves feel that same intuition, looking at the astonishing co-adaptation and complexity of all living things, from bacteria right on up to the mightiest redwood or blue whale. So I think that what we see in the debate about the cogency of neo-Darwinism the attempt to avoid randomness is really a response to a, a deep-seated intuition that all human beings have. And I think Dawkins is right about this. Living things occupy tiny neighborhoods of functionality in enormous spaces of non-function. As he put it so yeah. beautifully in The Blind Watchmaker, there are many more ways of being dead than alive. The possible arrangement... I fully agree. Yeah, so... I think that gives us some insight into why randomness is such a controversial topic in these debates. And I thank you for identifying some of the key features of neo-Darwinian theory with respect to the enormous number of possibilities that are out there for any living thing. Randomness is, in a sense, the enemy. Organisms do what they can to, for instance, as they're transmitting their genetic information, maintain its fidelity against the degrading processes of mutation and so forth. Can I say something? Sure. Well, this is just, we have just touched some of these things, and there's much more to be said. I would like to say to the hero of that podcast, have a look, please, at these posts, and especially on the other, many other topics which are discussed in connection with these things in my encyclopedia article, which is referenced in the posts of Evolution News and Views. 
Thank you so much. And once again, this is Paul Nelson coming to you from the Center for Science and Culture of the Discovery Institute. And we thank Wolf Eckhard Lernig for joining us today from Cologne, Germany. I thank you, Paul Nelson, for this interesting discussion. And I hope in the future we can continue our discussion on this topic. Thank you so much. Thanks, you too. This program was recorded by Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. ID the Future is copyright Discovery Institute, 2016. For more information, visit intelligentdesign.org or idthefuture.com.